uh, these sessions need to go together. Uh, they don't stand alone. So uh, now I can't go back and lay the same foundation every time. It, it, so you have to know that we've covered some of the things that are the foundation for what we're saying. And if you don't get that, you might draw the wrong conclusion. So I encourage you to go back and look at the whole series and put it together. Amen? Okay. Uh, just a little tiny bit of recap from last time. We talked about accountability, right? And uh, we talked about prophets being accountable in the Old Testament because it is common for people to think today that they were Lone Rangers and they weren't uh, accountable. So we established that they were accountable, first of all, to God. We showed you many examples, right? Uh, they're accountable to the nation, to the rulers, leaders, and also to each other. Amen? Uh, and then we saw the same thing with in the New Testament. They were accountable to God. Everybody's accountable to God. We all know that, right? And that doesn't, isn't just when you die. Okay? We're going to have to stand before him then. But every day, every hour, we're accountable to God in what we do. And the Lord intervenes in our lives. Amen? He does. And um, then, so the ch in, in the church today, the same thing, accountable to God, the church, and each other. Amen? Uh, but unfortunately, it's not being practiced. Hence, the teaching. Uh, the third one, the same. Accountable today, the same thing. Right? Amen? We looked at some of the fallacies of the prophetic, and we'll be doing more of that today. Uh, Number one, the Old Testament prophets were lone rangers. Already answered that. False, right? Old Testament prophets spoke a word, and people had to believe the word. Unless it didn't come to pass, then they could ignore the prophet or stone him. But in the New Testament, we just, uh, you know, discern and weigh things, and people, you know, basically can say whatever they want. Hello? We said, that's false. Amen? Today, the same standards apply. Uh, prophets should not speak presumptuously, and we still have to discern and weigh things, just that they had to discern and weigh things. The idea that they didn't discern and weigh things is ridiculous. Amen? Okay, and then uh, the last one we were working on was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Old Testament prophets were put to death if they spoke presumptuously, New Testament prophets are not held to the same standard. In other words, they can speak presumptuously. That's the implication, isn't it? Uh, but, of course, that's false. Uh, we looked at that, that speaking presumptuously was not uh, just a minor thing, that there's a, the, the word itself implies uh, arrogance to boil up seed, act proudly or presumptuously or rebelliously. So... There's an implication that there's something going on inside the prophet that is just making up stuff or trying to make himself popular or whatever. There's something twisted inside the person. They didn't just make a mistake. Okay? When you stand up before the nation and tell them to go the opposite way that God is saying to go. And, but people and prophets today, just as they did then, can be deceived and think they're really speaking from God when they're not. And we're going to talk a little bit today, if we can, about how you get to that place. Okay, so it's not a minor thing, but uh, the reason they were killed, right? What was the reason? Why don't we stone prophets today? Because we do not administer civil government. It's not our job. The church does not have the responsibility of civil government. That has been taken away it was never allowed to the church. It was part of Israel's life. They had to administer civil government. If we had to, things would be radically different. Thank God we don't, because the church is in no place to do that. When we go back to the time when the church was doing that, they are the worst, uh, probably the worst period in human history, since the cross, at least, anyway. Are you with me? Uh... So, we don't do that. It's not our job. But we still are responsible 
to uh, hold prophets accountable. Prophets have to be held accountable. Amen? Uh, the equivalent for the stoning today for the church would be excommunication. All right? Um, so they, they, people have to be held accountable. And th that doesn't just go for prophets. That goes for teachers. That goes for everybody. We're all accountable. Amen? We can't just get up and say what we want. Or we shouldn't. Uh, now, here's what Peter said. False prophets who arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you. So those false teachers and false prophets still exist today, do they? Somebody say no? Yes, they do, right? And they're proliferating all over the place. Um, now it says, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Um, now, um, it's important to point out that that's a process, and we'll deal with that later, but that eventually false prophets will deny the master. It's only a matter of time. They, they, they will get there, okay? False teachers will get there too. But destruction comes, the Lord will bring that judgment. If the man doesn't bring accountability, God will bring it. So let me ask you, should false teachers be disciplined? Yes, we all agree, right? Uh, because it's wrong, it's sinful. To, it's, it's, uh, to misrepresent God is an awful thing. Look what happened to uh, Moses because he... Uh, he, he didn't say anything wrong, but his attitude was wrong. And he was chastised for it and didn't get to go in the promised land. All right? Because we, we're not supposed to misrepresent God. Uh, should false prophets be disciplined? Well, we all see it with false teachers, but why doesn't this ap apply to false prophets? People who bring false prophecies over and over and over. Now, how should teachers and prop false prophets be disciplined? The same way that everybody else who, uh, who sins should be disciplined. Right? If we have, now again, we all stumble, we all sin, we all make mistakes. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a pattern, a habit of, of bringing false words, uh, teachings that are off. You know, if you bring five of your main teachings and they're off, there's a problem. It's not that you made a little mistake. But if everything you teach is off-center, that's what makes you a false prophet, false teacher. Are you there? Uh, so what we have to do is go through the process of Matthew 18, confront them in love, and uh, if they don't listen, then bring somebody else, and then eventually goes to the church. You know how that's supposed to go, in love and redemptively. How much less problem we would have if the church would learn how to do that? If we had leaders that weren't cowardly and would stand up for the truth, this thing could be a whole lot better. Are you there? Okay. Um, now, that's a picture of Balaam, by the way, uh, if you're looking on the right there. Um, if they're not called into account by the church, right? They're not. They're supposed to be called into account by the church. But if they're not and they are not called into account by, um, I have the same thing twice there, by their peers, it should say. If they're not called into account by their church and by their peers, uh, do they escape God's discipline and judgment? No, no they don't. And uh, by the way, uh, Balaam wasn't a false prophet. Think about that. Balaam was not a false prophet. He was a corrupt prophet. And that's something we'll get into. But anyway, God is merciful and long-suffering. But if people don't listen, they keep on being stubborn and going against him. The prophet, the Lord, shows up with the sword, right? And uh, he will use any means sometimes. In this case, a donkey. God will get the prophet's attention. They go too far. Are you there? Even today. Uh, Balaam was disciplined. This is the discipline, but he didn't listen even to this discipline. He didn't. He brought the word. He was. 
uh, you know, uh, scared enough not to bring the opposite word, God wouldn't let him. But he did counsel the people to do evil. And for that he was judged and he was killed along with the rest of the, of the uh, what were they, the Midianites? I think it was the Midianites uh, in the battle. Uh, he was killed as well because he was, that was God's judgment on him. Are you there? He was a corrupt prophet. Now, can we get rid of false prophets or teachers in the church? No, we cannot. Uh, we look at Paul's words to the, the elders of Ephesus. Um, Be on your guard for yourselves and for all the flock. Now, this is when he's going, seeing them for the last time, and there's all tears and everything because he's on his way to Jerusalem, and everywhere the Lord is saying that he won't, you know, he'll be in bondage in Jerusalem, he'll be in jail, and so on. Eventually he goes to Rome, so he doesn't believe he'll see them again, right? And they're all crying, and there's all the tears, but then he says to the elders when he gathers them to him, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. That's to shepherds or overseers. To shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Overseers and shepherds are the same thing. Uh, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you. That's number one. Uh, not sparing the flock. And from among you. That's number two. From your, among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Now, it's not just men, but it's men and women today. Okay? Um, so there's two places that they come from. They come from outside and they come from within ourselves, within our own uh, congregation. So um, we'll talk about that in a minute. But Paul was, what was Paul expecting the, the, uh, the church at Ephesus to do? Since he's given them such a warning. What do you think he was expecting? That they would confront false teachers, false prophets. Right? And protect the church. That was the point of the exhortation. To be on the alert for this. And the, the, also... The reality is that we can't get away from it because they will continue to arise, and especially in the last days. But we are supposed to be accountable, hold them accountable. Amen? Um, now, the church in Ephesus received the, uh, um, the words of Jesus in Revelation chapter 2. And so let's look at it. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false, right? And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake. And everybody reads this and ignores it. Because they all want to get to, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Well, uh, Paul, I'm uh, sorry, Jesus commands them. Paul had encouraged them and admonished them to beware of false prophets and teachers. And obviously, they had obeyed him. Hello? They had become well-known for a church that didn't allow shenanigans, that confronted false teachers and prophets and were able to discern the difference between the true and the false. And was Jesus confronting them for this? No, he commended them for this. And we missed that. People today act like, well, you know, they lost their first love because they did this. No, they lost their first love because they allowed themselves to turn, their hearts got cold toward their relationship with Jesus. How many of you know that uh, discerning what's true and false doesn't do that? Necessarily, that's totally up to you. Can you get there by being critical? Yeah, you can. But that does not mean that you're not supposed to uh, sort those things out. It doesn't mean that the elders in Ephesus, had they not, uh, had they tolerated evil men and not tested the apostles and all that, they'd be more in love with Jesus. That's why we're told today. That's rubbish. Agreed? Agreed? Yes? So, we need to understand that they should have done both. They should have done 
uh, what they did, which they were commended for, but they also should not have lost their first love, which we must, and we must do both today. And if there was ever a time for us to be uh, uh, sorting that out and deciding what's false, true and false, it's today. Amen? Amen. Okay. Um, now, who told us, what did Jesus say? Did he warn us about false prophets? Now, in this case, the false prophets here in Jesus' teaching and also in Paul's and Peter's teaching, it covers both, really. False prophets and teachers are both essentially the same. Okay? Because they do both. They, they're teaching people, but they're also teaching, prophesying with their teaching, what people should do and what they should give themselves to. So, it, in a sense, it covers both of those ministries. All right? Uh, Beware of false prophets. What does that sound like? You just ignore them? Huh? Observe them and pray for them? Uh, bless their ministries? After all, nobody has it all right. And notice how, now this is something, boy, this is really something. If you read this passage, the problem with us is, as always, we tend to take out passages or verses out of the context, don't we? And we don't get the whole thing. But you look at the whole thing. It starts off with beware. This is the Sermon on the Mount. It's the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. Beware of false prophets, right, who come to you in sheep's clothing, um, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. And what do wolves do? They eat the sheep. And how can a shepherd do anything but uh, deal with the wolf. How can a shepherd not be uh, get upset when wolves are around the sheep? What kind of a shepherd just says, oh, well, this is just okay. You know, they have a different point of view than me. <laughs> they just like a little, you know, lamb once in a while. Because when we see hordes of people being taught false things that are going to lead them to hell, how can we be so nonchalant? And be true shepherds. You say just about anything you can say today, except the truth. You can say just about anything, so long as you don't say Jesus is not God. If you say that, they'll they'll shoot you down. So and rightly so. But you have, you can just about get away with anything else. Is that the attitude that the apostles have? No, I don't think so. There's a whole lot of things, as we found out, when you study. The New Testament, you'll see that the Judaizers were also considered false brethren and uh, were strongly condemned by Paul. Are we there? And, of course, the Gnostics. Now, Gnostics are all over the place today. and Everybody's tolerating Gnosticism. Okay. Um, so every good... Then he tells you how to discern the difference, right? And then look at... He goes down to the passage that we used to skip for so many years. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. And he goes on to say, many will say to me on that day. And look at the many. What do they do? They pro Did we not prophesy in your name? Hello? And in your name cast out demons. So they're doing and perform many miracles. So these are big ministries. Uh, he's talking about the people today. We're talking about the end of the age. They're going to come to him at the end of the age. They'll look at the big ministries they have and all the demons they cast out and all of the prophecies they've had. Hello? And what's he going to say? Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So uh, I, I wanted to bring this. We need to bring this. This is current. This is not a word in Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 7. This is current. Okay, well, that was, uh, that was then. Today, we have all these great prophets. And more than ever, this is about today. That, that is what uh, many in the prophetic movement are claiming all these things, are focused on all these things, and many of them are in that category. That's a really popular word, isn't it? Okay, I'm not saying we should go around, please, I will we'll balance this. I'm not saying we should go around judging people with a bad attitude like a lot of them do on the Internet. 
But the opposite side of the coin is that we shouldn't call people out for teaching false teaching. And that's false. Right? We have a responsibility to do it. And they all have big ministries and miracles and angels and feathers and everything. Amen. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. This is, uh, I've kind of alluded to it already. The lack of correction and accountability in the church has encouraged false teachers and false prophets to proliferate. So this is how serious it is. And I'm really talking to leaders. Uh, they are responsible for all of the confusion in the church today because they have been cowardly and they have been more concerned about what's popular and about their ministries and about their friends than they have about the truth. They're friends. My friends. Okay. Um, if we had leaders today like the elders at Ephesus, things might be very different. We wouldn't have so many fat wolves going around. And boy, they are fat, aren't they? Loaded, as they say. All right, so a lack of correction and accountability in the church has encouraged false teachers and false prophets to proliferate. It's a, an important statement. And I think that when we stand up and confront one another in love, it, it, it brings a safeguard for everybody. It's a safeguard. It's a, it makes the place safe. If we, if we just allow everything to go on, that's not a safe place. Are you there? So God is expecting us, especially those who are leaders, to take responsibility for things that are being taught, that are, that are leading the church astray or sending the wrong message. And, and in love, they're supposed to confront it. And when it's an international stage, then they have to do it internationally. If somebody comes in and says something off the wall to our congregation, it's our responsibility to say that's not from the Lord and deal with it, right? We can, we can talk with the person in the back room, which sometimes we have to do. We don't want to embarrass them in front of everybody, right? But on the other hand, if what they said was public, then we have to deal with it publicly. Yeah. And the same is true for what's being spread all over the Internet, what's being taught at conferences, it's all public, right? And if we, you know, that does not bring disunity. What that brings is truth. What that brings is a healthier church. We can't have unity with people who are teaching false teachings. This is, this is ridiculous. Are you there? It's getting ridiculous. Now, let's remember that false prophets are always popular, and are always in the majority. That's a fact. You go from all through the scriptures, you find the false prophets were always more plentiful than true prophets. And they're always more popular. And they were never the ones stoned. You see, the, the, the Israelites, instead of doing what God said, stoning the false prophets, they stoned the true prophets. And that's what the church does today, unfortunately. They're the ones persecuted. Okay, how are we doing here? All right, let's go on. Uh, so, should the church have a lower standard than uh, the Old Testament? I think we're, we're getting this, aren't we? Um, all right, look what it says here. In, um, uh, this is Peter speaking. And each one has, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Amen? Um, go back. And yet, we are supposed to uh, pursue love, yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. So people are, you know, a lot of you are saying, I, I don't want to prophesy after this. But after all that you said, you know, how can I prophesy again? I'm afraid. Well, uh, let me ask you this question. So you're not going to teach then either? You're not going to talk at all? Right? Because he said when we speak, we should let it be, when we're speaking to God's people, we should let it be as the utterances of God. 
So that's not the right response, is it? All the more we should want to prophesy. All the more we should want to be true prophets. Because there are so many false prophets. Amen? All the more we should want to be true teachers of the Word of God. And yes, there is uh, a higher uh, judgment for, for those who teach. Uh, they're held to a, a, not a higher standard, but they're held to more accountability. Because the standard is the same for every Christian. Amen? But those who teach the Word are accountable to teach the truth. Amen. Now, uh, so to be afraid to prophesy because there are false prophets is the same as being afraid to teach because there are false teachers, and to be a Christian because there are false Christians. You see, so we, we, we can't succumb to that trap. Uh, surely, we, we, if you have a reverence for God's Word and a love for Him, and you're willing, correctable and teachable and, and humble, you shouldn't be afraid to move in any of these areas. Because God is gracious, and He will help you, and He will correct you when you need correction. The only problem is if you're not willing to walk in the truth and be corrected, then you have something to be concerned about. Not so, it doesn't really matter so much about your ministry at that point. It matters as to why you don't want to walk in the truth and be corrected. Amen? So it's, it's a false uh, notion, and we need to get rid of it. If any of you are thinking that because of what I said here, get rid of it. What we need is real, true prophets to stand up today. We need more Agabuses. More people like Agabus. Some of you didn't get that, went over your head, but that's all right. We'll go to the next one. Okay, next fallacy. How are we doing? We have 20 minutes, okay? We're doing good. Um, the next one, number four, Old Testament prophets did not see in part like we do today. True or false? False. Yes, it is false. See, we have this idea that they saw everything perfectly, and all they had to do was like read the like words on the screen. But that's not true at all. They had to go through all of it. Some of the time, they had to act it out and live it out and and experience it. They had to get the heart of God into them, which is what prophets need today. That's why they have to be made, and all. they're not just computers spewing out revelations they get every day. Hello? Uh, they need to carry God's heart, and they need to understand where, where, where the word is coming from and the heart that it's coming from and what it is God's saying and doing. Look at Isaiah. He had to name his children after what was coming on Israel. Uh, look, at, look at what Ezekiel had to do, sitting out on it, laying on one side and on the other for days and days and days. Look at all the things they suffered as God worked into them the character of a prophet. Now they are, again, we have pointed out in the, in the previous sessions that the prophets who were called to write down Scripture uh, were definitely, what they wrote down, they saw and was given to them, but they paid a price for it. But the Scriptures say, as 1 Peter uh, 1, chapter 1, Peter says they didn't see everything perfectly. Okay? As, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven." Things into which angels long to look. So all the, all, all the angels see what's going on either. Hello? Now, it says that the prophets made careful search and inquiry. There are things they did not see. There are mystery, the mystery of the church they did not see. They didn't see that. Okay? It wasn't given to them to see that. So the idea that they saw everything is wrong. What they saw, God made very clear to them. 
and they experienced it and lived it out and they proclaimed it. But they didn't always know exactly what they were proclaiming, did they? Amen? What did John the Baptist do? He proclaimed the word of the Lord that was burned into him. But then he had to send messengers to Jesus say, are you, are you really the guy? Or do we look for somebody else? Okay? So, conclusion, they saw pretty good, but they didn't see perfectly. Amen? So, you see, what's going on here is we're always coming from this position that we don't, you know, it's okay for us not to see very well. That's pretty much what we're concluding all across the board here. It's okay for today's prophets to be presumptuous. It's okay for them to get it wrong. It's okay for them not to see that clearly. Isn't this what we're concluding, right? And none of those things are biblical. On the contrary, we should see it clearer today. Because we have hindsight. We can look back and see what those guys did not see. They, did not, they saw both comings of Christ, but they didn't see that there was a big gap in between. We see that now, and we have so much insight that they didn't have. And we're living at the time where God is restore, fulfilling the words of the prophets, uh, the restoration of Israel, the soon coming of Jesus, all the signs are there. How much more do we need true prophets today? But we'll never get there unless we understand what the standards are and begin to follow them and walk in them. Amen? And we need, in order to do this, folks... We need to get serious about prophecy. Hello? We need to not, no, I don't want to prophesy anymore. That is the Jonah attitude. Hello? We can't adopt that. Because then you'll be swallowed by a big fish and, and life won't be so pleasant. So if you're called to minister the word, you, you should be excited to minister the word, whether it's teaching or prophecy. It's not that hard to be right. Oh, boy. It's not. Not if you're following Jesus. Not that hard to be right. You don't have to be a rocket scientist because he is so gracious to show us. And it's all in the Bible. Amen? And with, with all the, the, uh, the godly people that he puts around us, we are, should be more free, not less. But we should also be safe. Are we on the same page here? Yes, okay, good. For we know in part, Paul said, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. When we, now we see in a mirror dimly. If Paul saw dimly in a mirror, right? Now there's things we can see that he didn't see. Although they saw pretty much everything, didn't they? But we still see some more because we're living in the day. Um... But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. But now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. When we go to be with Jesus, we'll see everything face to face. We'll understand all the mysteries we don't get now. Amen? But now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. Okay. So Paul saying, we. Do you notice that? We prophesy in part. We know in part. Paul was one of the best teachers in the New Testament, was he not? But he's saying, I know in part. I don't have it all. So you don't have to get into this thing where you have to be perfect in order to teach or prophesy. You just need to be teachable and correctable and filled with God's love and compassion for his people. Amen? All right. All um, right. So we, we should be able to see even clearer today because we have the words of the scriptures to help us and guide us. And we have the fulfillment of the words in front of our eyeballs. All right. How are we doing? You still with me? You still nice and everything? Okay. What about learning or making mistakes? I knew you were going to ask this question, right? Well... That's the point, I think, of this passage in 1 Corinthians 14. And let two or three prophets speak, and let the others pass judgment. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, let the first keep silent, right? 
For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. And the gifts, the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. We talked about that already. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches. Okay? So, here, obviously, the reason they have to discern, the reason they have to judge the prophecies, hello? The reason some need to speak and others need to hold it is because they're learning. Agreed? That's, that's an atmosphere of the church where they're learning how to function and how to hear what God is saying and, and, and speak it and then be willing to be critiqued on it, to willing to have it judged and discerned. They're not being judged or condemned. Their words are being judged. See, if prophets were actually judged like that and trained like that, they would not be so careless. But what the way what they're taught today is they're taught how to prophesy and activate and all that, and they're never judged. And you can do it. Off you go. Right? Um, all right, so that's the whole point, I think, here. Right? Um, now, where did Paul and the apostles get this idea from that they could do this in the congregation? Is this a new methodology? No, I doubt it very much. Obviously, prophecy had been around throughout Israel's history. Remember, when Jesus was a baby and brought to the temple, two prophets came out of the woodwork. So this was not new to the Jews, right? Right? Besides John the Baptist, there were other prophets around. But of course, he was the one with the mission, sent by God with the mission. But there were other people who could prophesy and heard from God, even in New Testament times. Are you there? Um, so, did this happen in the Old Testament? Did people learn? Did people train? Did people make mistakes? We, we, we assume they didn't because what we read is the stuff that was declared by God. We, what we get is the, the mature prophets, but we're assuming. It's just an assumption. We have no basis for it. Uh, the chances are, and I think the, the implication from many passages is that they were learning and training just like we do today. Okay? Um, it's a, it tells us there were companies of prophets, Right? Are you there? Uh, there were uh, companies of prophets, started with Samuel, continued on in Israel, Elijah. They also had their trainees or the mentoring process. We look at uh, Elijah had Elisha, and Elisha had Gehazi. I was going to say Ben Gazi, but no, that wouldn't work. <laughs> Gehazi. But in a way, he sort of turned out the same, didn't he? Um, Anyway, so they, were, they had trainees. What, were these, uh, uh, what was Eli Elisha doing when he was with Elijah? He was watching everything and learning. And then he turns out to be an incredible prophet. What was, so how did Samuel learn? He was hanging out with Eli, and he learned how to hear the voice of God, and he learned how to speak. So they had to learn too. Amen? And so they were learning in the New Testament, in the congregations, that's where we learn. And, but we all, without the judgment part, you don't learn. You, all you learn to do is be careless and reckless and make a build a platform for yourself and make a, a name for yourself and all that stuff. That's what you learn. Are you there? But out of this learning process, we see mature prophets coming up in the New Testament, don't we? Like Agabus and... Philip had a whole lot of prophets in his house. and How many prophets were there in the New Testament? I think it was all over the place. Okay. Um, so there are many prophets mentioned in the Old Testament, and there are many false prophets in the Old Testament who didn't follow counsel or where their company of prophets were getting it wrong. Are you there? But they're not recorded. Only a few of their words are recorded just to illustrate. But much of it is not recorded because it wasn't the truth. And so only what's recorded is the truth. Amen? So all the false prophets today, they will come to nothing also. 
It's the truth that will stand. All right, uh, getting down to the wire here. I always seem like the message is short until I go preach it. Why is that? That's like, I can't seem to get away from that. I had the same number of slides as last week, but now I'm way behind because I guess God is emphasizing something different. Anyway, all right. So being a false prophet is more than just getting it wrong or making a mistake. Are you with me? Yes? Yes? Uh, Okay, any prophet can make a mistake, any teacher can make a mistake, but when your prophesying is continually false and leading people astray, when your teaching is continually false and it's not being corrected or challenged and leading people astray, that makes you have become a false teacher or a false prophet. All right? Uh, Now, there are false prophets that start out false, or the ones who come in from outside, as Paul said. But then there's the progression from a sheep to false prophet or false teacher, okay? Um, that's a progression. They're sheep that turned into wolves. That's scary, isn't it? But it happens all, all the time. Now, we have to believe today... We're being told that we have to believe that all these prophets that are all speaking, and many times contrary to one another, are speaking things that are contrary to the Word of God. We're supposed to believe they're all hearing from God, and we should listen to all of them. Can't be right. Amen? And what do we tend to do? Throw it all out. We just take charisma and fling it because there's too many false things on it, and there's a good one and a bad one, and a good one and a bad one, and a good one and a bad one. Right? Yeah. Shouldn't be that way. Should, should, what did James say? Should the fountain throw out bitter water and pure water? No. But that's because of the state of the leadership in the church. Uh, okay, so how do we get to that? Fa- it can happen to anybody. It usually happens... Uh, when people are not properly equipped in the Word, that's for starters. They have to be properly equipped, and they have to keep being equipped by the Word. And we talked about that, what that really means, as opposed to using the Bible as a magic wand, right? Uh, they need to be stable. A lot of them are emotionally unstable. Peter says it's the immature and the unstable that distort uh, the Scriptures, the ones who don't know anything, untaught, and the unstable. So there's something inside of them that's unstable. They have emotional issues. They have things that, you know, they're insecure, they're selfish, there's stuff going on inside that's guiding them rather than the Holy Spirit or the truth. Wrong motives, right? Uh, Looking for attention. That's generally how a lot of these people start off in ministry, looking for attention. And then they make up stuff to make themselves look really good. You say, people wouldn't do that today. Right. If I can sell you another bridge, if that's true. Right? Um, lack of accountability. We've already, that's a, that's a breeding ground for false prophets. Uh, they become prideful. You know, they're, they're very popular. Everybody loves them. The money's flowing in from the books and stuff, you know. And Man, you know, it become, become a little careless. I like this. And the love of money comes in there, gets a hold of their heart. And now they're not so worried about speaking what God is saying. It's more important that we keep the money flowing. Hello? That we keep all of our friends and acquaintances And so now if I speak that, I'm going to lose my network. I'm going to lose all those opportunities to speak and go to conferences and be the guy on the platform. If I come out and say that or speak what that guy's saying is wrong or corrected, I'm I'm going to be thrown out of the club. Hello? Uh, Then they won't receive correction. This is very common. I am shocked 
by the number of people in the prophetic uh, movement who will not receive correction. I am even more shocked at the number of people in the revival, Father's Heart movement, who won't receive correction at all. Are you there? You're there. Okay. Uh, then they begin to compromise, developing wrong motives, you know, keeping, staying fat now is more exciting than preaching the truth. How did the, the church in Ephesus get off the track? Obviously, some of the same issues, right? Um, then they drift into telling God what to do. That's where they're at today. The prophets are all decreeing. We've got all kinds of prophets and apostles now. We've got weather apostles now. Can you believe it? They decree what the weather is going to be. They tell the storms what to do. Um, love of money, fame, supernatural power. They're all about supernatural power. And they go, they, believe it or not, some of them will make up words and doctrines to keep the ministry going, said all that. And what happens is they start to drift and get out, step outside of the Scripture. And this is, the, this is the track downward. This is how they slip into becoming false prophets. This is how you go from a sheep to a wolf. You don't wake up a wolf. You go through the process of backsliding. And you look really spiritual while you're doing it. And everybody thinks you're wonderful. And then we find out later that you were living in immorality or something was wrong and nobody saw it. How does this guy be this great teacher and this great apostle of eschatology and he's got all these books and he's going around and they're all from all the big ministries of pushing him, the greatest teacher in the century, they call them. And then it turns out that he was abusing women and had been doing it for years right under their noses. And that he was making up stuff in a fake. Hello, are you there? So I think I have to stop there now. The next one is going to be next week. See, this is turning into a, a huge. Uh, so it might even take the month of March. But after that, we're going to be hearing some other things. Amen? All right. Um, the next one is going to be, and we'll stop here. Old Testament prophets were always speaking judgment and correction. New Testament prophets are to judge and comfort, are to just comfort and console people. Okay, so that, uh, you have to think about that before next week. Is that true or false? Okay. Uh, you're all in the ball already. Okay. Well, we're going to show, start off with that one next week. So, Lord, we thank you for your blessing. Lord, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, that we can be safe in your congregation and we can learn how to speak and how to prophesy and, and to teach your word, Lord, without fear because you are a good God and you are watching over us. And, Lord, you are, you are gracious and merciful and loving kindness, full of loving kindness and truth. Thank you, Lord. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord let his face shine on you, lift up his countenance on you, y'all, <laughs> and give you peace. Amen.